all that happens in meditation is immeasurable. We live according to economic standards and measure everything in terms of money. Economic says money is the measuring rod. But in the field of meditation, this becomes redundant. There is a story about Jesus that Judas sold Jesus for a mere 30 silver coins. This is a strange that someone can sell a man like Jesus for 30 coins. You also do this. Then it does not matter if you sell for 30 coins or 30,000. A measurement is measurement. One thing is certain, Judas remained for so long, yet still Judas could not see Jesus. So when someone offered 30 coins for his whereabouts, Judas agreed. To Judas, 30 coins were more valuable than Jesus. You see only that which you can value. People always inquire what will happen if I go into meditation. Man is profit oriented. Everything he measures business life. Everyone wants to know if meditation can lead to this or that. If meditation can get him a better job or can lead to God. It is not that these people do not know that meditation leads to bliss. But the problem is that bliss has no value. It cannot be measured. The understanding is theirs. Language is there. All these people want to know is how to value that which comes when meditation happens. What is the economic yardstick for this? They are right and they are asking because life's entire economics moves in terms of utility. One hour of work can be measured in terms of money because the principle of minimum wage according to your capability applies and everywhere we pay by the hour. But what would you gain for one hour of meditation? All that you gain through meditation is immeasurable. As long as you are searching the value and your focus is that of an economist, you cannot enter meditation. You are caught in the world of value or measure. God implies the immeasurable. With God you enter that which is beyond all measure. That is why it is said that which is beyond the illusion mala, the measurement, is the realm of God. His attributes are immeasurable. His business is immeasurable, so are the traders and the stocks. Who are his, his traders? Indeed, the saints, the masters, the Buddhas, the enlightened ones, they are his treasures. They are here to sell you something for which you cannot be courageous. They want to give you something which is not only valuable, instead that for which you are not ready yet. Your economics cannot comprehend that which is free, can really be invaluable. God is available free. This is the reason you do not value. If there is a prestigious price tag, then it can catch your attention. Buddha, Nanak, Kabir, Meera, Lao Tse, 
Jaratrust, Bodhi Dharma, they are his traders. However, their way of trade is different. His trade and his style you cannot understand. It is said that Nanak's father Kali Mehta thought Nanak to be useless. He wanted Nanak to prove his worth, be useful. Kalu Mehta's thinking was business-like. He wanted Nanak to be successful as businessman. Only that far his father could think. Such is the case with each parents. Kalu could not see anything valuable in Nanak. Now and then someone will tell Kalu about the incredible Nanak. However, his father could not see beyond the finite in Nanak. Valuable in Nanak, he does not have the capacity even to earn a penny. All he can do is waste money. How can Nanak be valuable? Such was the understanding of Neta Kalu, his father. Whatever you earn in this life world is useless in the life beyond. All the gain in life beyond proves useless in your world. A disgusted Kalu Mehta thought at least Nana can take care of animals for grazing. This is the last work that a man can do. So Mehta Kalu asked him to do at least this work. The life and the world cannot move by singing songs or sitting with eyes focused towards the sky. His father was totally worldly. And he is concerned about Nanak's life and future. How can he, uh, how he can make his living with such laziness, understanding and waste? Nanak agreed to take the animals to the forest for grazing. The reason was different. Nanak always liked the company of animals than men. To him, animals are more authentic and blissful. Animals have no economics. They do not think in terms of value for money. Nanak agreed. He always liked sitting by the side of the cows and buffaloes. At least there is no economics. As silence surrounds the animals, there is no profit and loss situation. Animals leave themselves along his will and breeze. No ego and no will of theirs. Animals are innocent. And in the process of growth, animals are innocent. No ego and no will of their own. And in the process of growth, man has lost his childlike innocence. So Nanak left with animals. However, his ways remains unchanged and have created trouble for his father. The animals started grazing and he said graze happily. Nanak sat with eyes closed, drowned in his meditative flights. Animals entered neighbor's field and grazed the entire crop. And when the owner came to complain, as he wanted the compensation, Nanak opened his eyes and said something that cannot be understood by the world. Nanak said, Do not worry, as the fields are his, so are the animals and the crop as well, and he will be amply rewarded. This man could not understand. He could only see the loss of his crop. The man got hold of Nanak's father as he wanted the compensation for the loss. He carried Mehta Kalu Nanak's father to the village chief, a Muslim called Shahbula. The chief loved Nanak, so he thought 
it is necessary to know Nanak's viewpoint as well. Nanak says everything happens by his will alone, the cosmic law the hukum. In his scheme nothing can be wrong. It is he who sent the animal, it is he who is responsible for the crop. When the crop can grow once, it can grow a second time again. And not only a second time, instead a thousand times. There is no question of any loss. The man insisted that the field be visited as proof of his claim. The story says when the chief went with the man to the field, it was found the crop was intact and there was no loss. It was found that the crop in that field was incomparable to other fields. It is important to this happen like this or not. Certainly it gives a sublime message. One who resigns everything to the cosmic law or the divine will is benefited. Nanak left himself to his hukum and the crop that happened in his life is incredible. One only has to be courageous to take such an approach in life. The owner could not believe all that he saw. The greatest miracle in the world is to leave everything to the divine will, to hukum, the cosmic law. And then things will begin to happen miraculously, even beyond your understanding. No human intellect can understand this. There is no rational explanation for this. The only explanation is one who leaves everything on him in his life, every day, miracles happen. You cannot find any intellectual explanation for this. You cannot find any intellectual explanations for this. Whenever the immeasurable enters in your life, things happen like riddles. These riddles are the secrets which have only one explanation that now you have moved from the realm of the finite and quantification to immeasurable. Meditation has begun to happen. From the finite you have moved to the infinite realm. The unknown has now entered in your life. As soon as the unknown enters in your life, miracle begins to happen on a day-to-day -day basis. And you can now start reaping the crop of miracles. This is the immeasurable part of the meditation. Nanak is a trader but of a different world. We have always ill-treated such traders of the other world. We crucified Jesus, we poisoned Socrates, we tortured Alilaj Mansur and even if we did not poison or crucify them, we did not listen to these traders of the other realm. Even if we worship these people, yet still we never heard them. Worship is a stick, worship is a trick of the mind. We say you are indeed great. How we can reach you? You are high up there and I am here. There is no way that we can become one like you. Even with your worship, you remain the same. Your worship is false. And even with all your worship, you remain unchanged. That will simply mean it is false. The only criteria of a true worship is that it should transform you. It should sow the seeds of transformation. You pay respect to Nanak and yet it still remains the same. These are all the tricks of the mind.
try to understand a single word and a single word is capable to transform these are the respecting the person is not important understanding him is important you go on giving so much arguments your time has not yet come you still have too many unfinished responsibilities in the world you postpone for tomorrow your worship and ways of respect are all false and full of tricks people of athens could not tolerate socrates so they poisoned jews could not tolerate jesus so they crucified him indians are little more sensible we neither poison nor crucified nanak krishna kabir ram and buddha instead they we worship them remember jews are not free of the guilt of crucifying jesus as yet such thing creates guilt within jews are not free of this guilt as yet and they can never be free of it again and again the guilt keeps on reminding them this keeps them reminding jesus we got rid of such people such people do not create any ripples in us we will worship them and worship is the simplest way of getting rid of such people the real question is not that of worshiping nanak instead is a question of becoming one like him and that you can do only if you understand a single syllable and start it start bringing in practice it happened that happens on a day to day basis people consider this money is mine the my money your money when everything belongs to god and it comes from god who are you is the money really yours i am simply a custodian of the money that i have I have been given a certain amount of resources in the form of finance in the form of intellect and what am I supposed to do utilize it for the benefit of humanity just as I am the managing director the company has put his trust put their trust into me to manage the affairs and as I manage the affairs efficiently my books go on increasing so to if you are thinking in terms of economic aspect of it this is what happens god has given you wisdom god has given you financial resources you are this custodian you are carrying on his business bringing people what is his business bringing people more and more into his fold and the more successful you are in that your perks goes on increasing in the same way you are not a salary person you get the bliss whatsoever you get you can consider as part of your perks that god keeps on giving you on a daily basis but everything belongs to him the money is not mine if he wants me to give x amount of money to someone i am simply a custodian i have no decision to make for that if he wills to take away everything from me let it be so he will put me into some other place if he sells his business why should i worry i am doing my work honestly straight forward he can put me into another office company that is what happens when we are part of the business community these people do not create any repugnance we will worship them and worship is the simplest way of getting rid of such people 
The real question is not that of understanding the masters, the nanaks. Instead, it is the question of becoming one like him. This can happen only if your understanding changes to that of these masters. Nanak says everything belongs to him. The animals are his, the crop is his. Then what is mine? The question is not that of offering flowers to Guru Granth Sahib or Bible or Holy Quran or anything else. The real question is that of becoming the scripture yourself. The question is that your each syllable should resonate or bring the echo of the existential sound within and without. For this you have to undergo transformation. The Sufi poet Alama Iqbal says, Once I bow down in namaz, my head went down in offering namaz, I get the message, the echo from the earth. The echo from the earth came, your heart is clear, crystal clear. What shall you gain by offering namaz? As I bow down, bend my head. In offering my prayers in namaz, which is incumbent on Muslims, a voice, an echo came from the earth. Your heart is clear like a mirror. You, What will you gain from the prayers? What will you gain from namaz? This is one of the beautiful compositions of Allah Iqbal. Now, can any Muslim fundamentalist accept this. It is said that five times offering namaz prayers is incumbent on every Muslim. But what is the understanding of Allama Iqbal? He was close, he is closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than all your so-called Muslim priests. Nanak is of the same nature. The only question is that your each syllable could resonate or bring the echo of the existential sound both within and without. For this you have to undergo transformation. We go on lamenting that this man is not paying me, that man is not paying me, I lost so much money in business. Who are you to lose or gain? Everything belongs to the Divine. If He wants, He is keeping a record what you really deserve and what you do not. And whatsoever you really deserve, you get it. All you have to bring more trust into it that God will take care of everything. Again and again I told you the story of St. Teresa, the woman saint. She was crazy. She lived in a village and there was no church. So one morning she came out for the sermon and she said, We do not have a church in this village. We will make a church. So the people in the village were poor. They said, where will you get the money? So Teresa said, I have the money. So everyone was surprised from where did Teresa get the money to build the church. She opened that the long time people had the habit of keeping their money tied up in their clothes. You know, make Whatever apparel they have it on, they tie the money at one corner of it. If they are wearing the Indian style clothes, at one end of the sari, they will tie their money and the coins. She opened that knot and took out a 25 cents and said, look, this is the, I have the money. 
People said that I know you are crazy, but you will be so crazy we did not know. How can you build a church with 25 cents? Quarter? She said, yes, I can build it. And I have a quarter and I have him with me. I will only start. This is my first step. And ultimately he has to finish. I am nowhere in that to finish it. Such an understanding is the way of religious one. I am simply sitting down, doing my work as I am supposed to do. My 25 cents, the quarter of my effort has to be there. And once you put your quarter effort, the rest three quarters will come miraculously from the divine. Nanak says his traders are unique and if you have to move towards him then you have to understand his traders. You cannot even bring them in finiteness. All your yardsticks will fail even with them. They are beyond all your understanding. One who comes to take and also one who takes away are all valuable. There everything is unique and valuable. His price is valuable, also his samadhi. The moment of feeling for him arises within, you have entered a new realm. Nanak says his awareness, remembrance and feelings sends you in a different realm. When his name attains fruition, then his name alone is Samadhi. Try to understand the difference between feeling and Samadhi. Feeling means a glimpse. Feeling means that for a moment you are drowned in him. It is like someone taking a dive and the next moment you are out of water. As long as you are in the water, after the dive, his presence surrounds you. This is the meaning of the feeling. Feeling means a thought comes, a feeling comes into you about a person or something, as if you are drowned into his presence. As long as that feeling will remain, you will constantly think about that person, that thing. You are almost drowned into his presence. And this is the meaning of feeling. That's why Nanak says feeling becomes Samadhi. There was another master during the time. His name was Sheikh Farid. One day he was going to the river for a bath. An aspirant asked him the way to attain to God. But he asked the man to follow him. On reaching the river bank, he asked the man to take a bath first and then, if he gets a chance, even while taking the bath, he will definitely show the way. This frightened the man. He asked about the God, and Farid says that this will this he will tell you even while taking the bath. The man found himself in a difficult situation. The thought was there in him. Maybe Farid will explain while in the water. Somehow he gathered courage to enter the river for the bath. While taking bath, as the man took a dive, Farid pounced on him and started pressing the man into the water. The man felt helpless. Farid was a strong man and the other person was lean and thin. He could do nothing in front of Farid. All his efforts to offset the force failed. Then the desire to survive became intense. The man put all his force and energy and pushed so hard that he threw Farid outside and he also came out of the water. Now it was the turn of the man to abuse Farid 
in every possible manner. The man said, I always thought you to be a saint, but you tried to drown me in the river. Is this, is this the way to teach? Farid responded, All your complaints I will deal later. Your memory is shallow. And before time lapses, let me answer your query. Now I want to ask you something. When I was forcing your head to remain under the water, what thoughts were in your mind? The man said, Are you mad or something else? There was only one thought. How to come out of the water and get fresh drink. For he said, You have understood the secret. The day you are free from any thought except the thought for God, that very day you will attain. This is feeling. Feeling is a state when there is no thought in your mind. Only awareness is. Feeling is awareness of that. Awareness. And if there is witnessing alone, the being is there. Soon you will come out of the deep waters. This is what Nana calls as bhav of feeling. And Samadhi is the ultimate state of feeling, self-how. This is the point of no return. Then such feeling continues. You are now one with that feeling. This is not diving. Instead, this is drowning. You are fluid like. You are like the one made of salt and salt has now dissolved in the water, leaving no trace of you. And whenever anyone will taste the water, certainly he will get your taste. You do not have separate entity. In feeling you are separate. Sometimes you get the glimpse. In Samadhi you are one. The glimpse now becomes the eternal. Nanak says, when his feeling is so intense and valuable, then what can be said of Samadhi? And Nanak continues to sing. He sings, his religion is unique, his court or darbar is unique, his way of judgment or his scale is unique, so his is bounties proofs and symbols. Try to understand this. Nanak says, symbols are unique. How is this possible? Symbols is a quite complex. Hindus discovered thousands of symbols, idols, holy places are all symbols. A Muslim cannot understand the significance of these symbols. To him these are not religious. As a result, he destroys the Hindu symbols. In doing this, he feels, if the idol cannot protect itself, then how will it protect the devotees? And that is how another way of worship became. Swami Dayanand had similar experience. One day while he entered his prayer room, he saw a mouse climb up the idol and the idol cannot even remove the mouse. A Muslim missed, so did Diana. A symbol is symbol and a symbol is a symbol. A symbol is not God. Symbol implies you are on the journey. It is the symbol that takes you on to the journey. The road map is not the destination. The road map of a country does not represent the country, but it says something about the country. It helps you to locate the geography of the place. It is a symbol. The road map or the map of a particular city or a country is the symbol of that country. Symbol cannot be destination. It is like your beloved has presented you a handkerchief. Handkerchief is not even worth a dollar. 
no one will be willing to buy if you want to sell the handkerchief. But this reminds you of your beloved. Your many emotions or feelings are associated with it. For you this handkerchief is invaluable. This is not a mere handkerchief. This handkerchief is symbol. It bridges you with your beloved. The handkerchief has touched your beloved. In a deeper sense, the soul of your beloved has dissolved in that symbol. It is no more ordinary for you. For you it is a symbol of love for your beloved. For others, it will remain a mere handkerchief, a piece of cloth. A Hindu idol is a symbol for Hindu alone if a feeling has evolved within. For a Muslim it is a mere piece of stone. A Jain, a Jain idol is a symbol for him, not for others. So too an idol of Buddha is a Buddhist symbol. The value of a symbol depends on feeling and how. A symbol is a private affair. One whose feelings are attached to be the symbol really knows its value. For him it is unique and precious. Never disrespect any symbol. You know it is an ordinary handkerchief. It is an ordinary teddy bear. But many emotions of the child are connected with that. It is close to your heart. You can bring any number of handkerchief or teddy bear, but none will be as precious as the one close to your heart. This is an individual happening. Nanak says his symbols are unique and precious. He is precious. If you have reached him through a symbol, that medium is also precious. This is most sublime message of Nanak. All symbols are unique because these take you to your destination, your symbol of love. A symbol can not be right or wrong. It is simply a device. It bridges you to your beloved. Strangely enough, a Muslim can see the futility of Hindu idols, but he cannot see the futility of his symbol, the Kaaba. Every Muslim kisses the Kaaba and so many kisses have been placed on this stone that is incredible. It is difficult to find such a stone with so many kisses. A Muslim feels like kissing a Kaaba. This is a ritual. This is sublime. At the same time, he feels like destroying all Hindu stone symbols. What an understanding in the name of religion. A religious person understands a symbol is a private affair, sometimes which is not a symbol for me can certainly be a symbol for the other. A symbol cannot be proved publicly. In the name of religion this is happening. Symbol is connected with inner feeling. Feeling is an inner happening, something that happens deep within you. For someone a body tree is a symbol to respect it. Never question his love and trust. Puja can happen in any way. It is a spontaneous. If you analyze scientifically, a bodhi tree, a handkerchief, a stone, a marble statue is matter. Religion is the realm of love. Religion is the culmination or the fruition of love, not a matter of logic or intellect. Everyone carries his symbol and problem arises with the symbol of others. When you preserve your love symbol, and let others carry their symbols as well. If a Gautam can be enlightened under a Bodhi tree, what is wrong with it? If someone starts dancing around the tree and can be blissful, that is precious. 
wherever your heart begins to dance out of ecstasy, many a Kaaba, many a Bodhi tree will mushroom in your being. An entire existence is permeating with subtle presence. This is Nanak's way of glorifying him. His bounties are precious. His grace is not only precious, instant, infinite as well. So is his cosmic law of hukum. He is more precious than precious itself. This cannot be described. Many attain to meditation in the process and a rare one attains to enlightenment along the way. This is the only purpose of enchanted him. Understand this? Again and again Nanak says there is no way to glorify him. And yet still an ecstatic Nanak goes on glorifying him. In so many words Nanak glorifies him. With this an intellectual riddle comes. Many ask, if this is so, then why Buddha spoke for 40 years? Or why Nana goes on singing like an intoxicated one? Or why did the other masters speak? Or why do I go on overthrowing even after so many hours of course? Try to understand this.